Hello there and welcome back to the channel. This is Nerd World History and I'm sorry to say we interrupt your regular programming to bring you a slightly different video just because I felt like it. Don't worry, the other Celtic videos are coming, but I do like to do something different every now and again. And this video is on the Grass Dieu. At least I think that's how you pronounce it. I'm not good with French. It was the flagship of Henry V, not to be confused with the later Henry Grasse for Henry VIII. This is the original one, the, the pseudo-Royal Navy Carrick. This vessel actually predates the official formation of the Royal Navy by Henry VIII, as this was in service with, during the Hundred Years' War by Henry V, who was the one who ordered its construction at its time. It was the largest warship in Europe. Before we get started, please like, share, subscribe and comment down below if you like this video. Hit the bell notification icon if you like the other videos on this channel and want to get notified when they are uploaded, if that's something you're interested in. Before we properly get into this video, I just wanted to say something, which is a thank you to some people who have donated to my channel. I don't normally ask for donations, but I do have a a thing to click on to give. I don't ask for it because I think it's cheeky and most of my videos on all my channels they're not monetized. They, I don't I do this mostly for my own benefit and for fun as I, I used to do this for a living a long time ago and I don't anymore and I miss it so I do this kind of stuff because I enjoy it not necessarily because I get any money out of it. I do already have a full-time job which is why my upload schedule is a little sporadic sometimes as I work 40 odd hours a week as it is and I do this in my spare time but I have a child house and all the rest of it and you know money isn't always you know flowing so the money that I do get given I am using it to upgrade equipment like how I bought this for example and I just wanted to say thank you to the people that have donated it's not a requirement so it is something that is appreciated very much and now I've got past that awkward cringiness we'll get into this well this being this video is brought to you in collaboration with the beard struggle who we'll get to later in the video and now we'll get into the video So what was the Grasdjur? The Grasdjur was a Carrack type vessel. And what was a Carrack you might ask? Now it, it's, the Carrack was what you imagine as a medieval vessel. You all kind of know it. It's big wooden ship with a large fore and aft castle because we're talking a time period before modern warfare really hit in oceans. Before this time period, ocean going warfare was not unheard of it was just less common the Romans the Greeks we've all heard them the trireme with a big battering ram that kind of style of warfare had stayed around for a long time then in come the Vikings and basically ships are just used for getting from A to B and actual naval engagements were more along the lines of trying to take what you knew on land and put it on the ocean hence the fore and aft castle the forecastle forecastle whatever you want to call it which is basically an elevated part of the ship with battlements which were reminiscent of those of a castle and the people on board the ship would use it to rain down fire hopefully on the enemy vessels and then do the same at the coast um yeah typically a carrack would have three or four masts and was a large ocean going vessel they were developed in the later medieval period mostly used well, at least initially, they were sort of they came from Spain and Portugal, but would obviously be used by pretty much everyone: the French, the English, everybody used these things. Originally developed as a type of com commercial ship, a commerce vessel, trade ship, but we're talking again a time period before the idea of a state-funded, state-run navy existed. So warships were often built when needed. Or you simply took a vessel you already had, a merchant ship, and you converted it. As a result, carracks quickly became used as warships during times of conflict, but again, mostly for transport. But you were entering a period where purpose built, dedicated combat vessels were starting to come into existence, because, of course, a commercial ship doesn't worry about 
damage as much. It doesn't have to store weapons and ar men at arms as well. So, or have gun ports for that matter, because again, 15th century, we're starting to see more widespread use of cannons. So that brings us to the ship, and why was it? I mentioned it before that this is the largest vessel in Europe at the time of commissioning. The vessel was built in 1418 and commissioned into service in 1420. Upon commissioning, again, it was the largest vessel around. Now, the English had defeated the French at the Battle of Agincourt, and this had marked effectively the end of major armed engagements between the English and the French, although by no means the end of them, of course, it was a war, but they'd wiped out the flower of French nobility at that battle, but that was on land. At sea, the English were faced with a problem which was similar to the one that we normally think about other people having. As British, we often go on about things like the Battle of Trafalgar, we talk about, we talk about the um, Spanish Armada, 15... 88, stuff like that, and how difficult it is to get to Britain. I've mentioned in other videos how Julius Caesar had a lot of his fleet wrecked by storms in the North Sea, because this is because Mediterranean powers like the French, the Italians, they're used to much calmer seas and don't build the kinds of vessels that sail up north. And we don't typically build vessels that will be used in the Mediterranean, uh, which is something I'll explain in later videos, not really going into in this one. But basically, we were faced with the exact opposite problem to what we normally think of. We needed to invade Europe, and that's an offensive war, which means we were having to do the exact same thing. To get to France, we have to do the same, overcome the same obstacle that they do when they come here, and that's the English Channel. And the French Navy has always been a rival to the English Navy, and in the Hundred Years' War, the French had allies. The Burgundians, who initially became basically as the English eventually, but there was also the Genoese, a Mediterranean power, who were assisting the French with naval assets, and they had the biggest, baddest ships around, lots of carracks. This vessel was built as a response to them. It was double the size, pretty much, of anything that they had. And that was the idea. Bigger is better. And, yeah pretty much the same sort of military thing you get nowadays. So Henry wanted a ship that was not just symbolically greater, but was physically greater. It was a purpose-built combat vessel. Now, cannons were relatively new at this time period, so the vessel only had about three guns, and mostly relied on archers and its ability to kind of overwhelm an enemy. But this is where the sort of sad tragedy of the ship comes in. In fact, calling a ship Grace of Dure is probably a tragedy always oh, seems to be a bad idea bad things happen to these ships and its only voyage and it only went on one was a disaster it set sail with a small flotilla of vessels to go out into the english channel before it even set off the crew mutinied and they didn't like that army personnel were coming aboard the ship they tried to prevent it even going as far as to accost the registrar who was trying to register the people coming on board. The vessel would eventually set sail and sit and saw yet another mutiny as the crew refused to take their stations, eventually forcing the ship's commander to take it to the Isle of Wight and disembark the crew. And there was further problems at this point, with them once again resulting to hostilities as their loyalties were brought into question. The vessel then was taken up the River Humble, Humber? Humber, and was eventually moored in a sort of improvised port dug out of the bank where it remained for the rest of its career. Initially, for many years, it was left to simply guard the River Humber and work as a big symbolic sort of floating castle to prevent anyone coming up, which it did perfectly well until. Again, it was stripped of its sails and its masts and simply moored. It was used as little more than a fine dining establishment for the dockmasters. Eventually, in 1439, it was struck by lightning and burned down to the waterline. Obviously, this marked the end of the vessel's career after just 19 years, well, 21 years if you want to include its non-commissioned floating time. After that, it was simply stripped of any remaining wood and all of its iron over the next few years, which was quite valuable, so it was stripped and re-melted down to be reused. Again, the vessel was very impressively built, though. It was a clinker-built ship, which is a very ancient technique. It's still used nowadays in rowboats and small vessels bob around the rivers. Back then, 
This one was a particularly impressive one. It had a sort of three layered clinker built hole. And clinker building is basically where you have overlapping panels of wood. And it was held together by large, massive, great big iron ship nails. And then had an inner frame, of course, to give the ship rigidity. It was an impressive ship, but very regrettably never really saw much service. And this, again, I should point out, was in a time before the Royal Navy had been established. So ships were privately owned, either by the King or by whomever. This vessel was co-funded by another individual. So when the King died in 1422, he became sort of the overall man in charge of the entire Royal Navy. And many of them were just simply sold off to pay off debts from the Hundred Years' War, I think money the King owed. This vessel was not sold off and remained in service, but never went out. It never went out to sail again in the open ocean that we know of. It simply stayed there and rotted. And recently, actually, one of the reasons that inspired me to do this video is not only I have an interest in naval history broadly, but also I watched an episode of Time Team recently where they actually were excavating the remains of this ship in the Humber and. It made me re reminded me I really like this ship, and I like it when we when someone builds something so big and so dumb that it's almost not practical, which is probably the problem with this ship. There must have been, although it's not overly recorded in the documents, there must have been an issue with it. Maybe it was simply too big for its time. The ship was before its time, a bit like uh, the new American destroyers. They're immensely advanced but they're perhaps a little too advanced for their own good. They become technically unmanageable. Ammunition from their advanced guns costs a million dollars per shell, so they're so expensive you can't fire them. Or you don't want to fire them. So there is an element of this vessel was perhaps a little too advanced and before its time. It would be 200 years before a similar sized vessel would be built by the Royal Navy. So yeah, this ship was advanced and large for its time and perhaps a little too grand. Maybe the crew were on, felt it was too top heavy and would capsize or something. Whatever the reason, there was clearly to me some problem with the ship and that's why no one ever took it out again. It also didn't help that Henry V died just a couple of years after it was built and this was his ship. If he'd have lived and continued on to become King of England and France like was supposed to happen, he likely would have continued to use a ship, maybe even built more of them, but as it stands, it's a singular vessel from a singular time period in our history, which isn't as well remembered as ships like the Mary Rose or the Victory, but I think deserves its place in history just for being so big and dumb. Well, it might not even have been dumb, but I'm going to call it big and dumb. Okay, so before we go any further though, I'd just like to remind everyone that this video is brought to you in collaboration with The Beard Struggle, who have helped me to tend this magnificent, glorious beard, which, you know, has done wonders for my girlfriend just wanting to sit there and stroke it. And I'm okay with that. They are linked in the description below. If you follow the link, you will get a 15% discount off your first purchase from them. And they obviously do everything to do with beard care. They do some very fun advertisements. They also do a lot of video tutorials about how to, you know, properly groom and maintain your beard. I recently got both the beard straightener, but also more recently than that, I bought the little, which I've completely forgot it's called, little spiny thing that you roll on your face that punctures your skin and increases blood flow to thicken up your beard. Now, it doesn't really need thickening up, but I felt like it anyway, so whatever. And again, linked in the description below. Follow it, get 15% discount. This helps out the channel. And again, if you have a glorious beard and you want it to be even more glorious, they have their range of beard oils, as well as, again, that beard straightener, which is a lot of fun. It's really warm, it's wireless, because who wants wired in the 21st century when you can have a wireless one? Because, you know, next thing is just to make it Bluetooth. I don't even know why you'd want it Bluetooth, but I'm sure there's some reason. Maybe you can have music playing out of it or something. If it's got Bluetooth in it, I'll probably buy it. As I'm told, that Bluetooth makes men want things. You know, it's probably true. If I found out there was a Bluetooth hair clip, I'd probably buy it. I don't even have hair. Where was I? Beard Struggle. Check them out if you want to improve your glorious beard. Or have a glorious beard if you don't think you have one. It's quite glorious enough right now. Moving on, back to the video. 
Now, as interesting as this ship is, I know some people are thinking, why have I bothered doing a video about it? It only had one voyage and it wasn't exactly very successful, although it is relatively interesting to hear about the mutiny, so what? Well, there is an element of that, but it's also interesting that we, someone goes out of their way to build something so big and so powerful and then not use it. It's a question to me. But also, you're in a very interesting period of time in history, and I find it to be an interesting period of change. You're looking at the first, I mean, not the first stirrings of an idea of a state navy. I mean, uh, Edward the Confessor had had a royal navy. The problem is the idea comes and goes. It went up to Henry VIII to officially found it into government, into parliament, as part of something that would be separately funded continuously by taxpayers' money for the defence of the realm. Now, looking back at Carracks and things like that, they were all non-commissioned civilian ships, commercial vessels, which would be pressed into warfare when needed. And eventually some people got in there, particularly kings, would think to themselves, I'll build a few of them that are purpose-built, so I've always got a few ships around, but these vessels would often change hands, not last very long, or whatever would be the thing that they would go. But this time period shows, it starts to teach people that Battle of Agincourt tells us that knightly warfare is on its way out. It was the archers and the general men-at-arms who were the victors in that battle. The French considered it dishonourable, as did the English, to die at the hands of a, you know, just lowly grunt soldier and not another knight, because another knight would have taken a prisoner and, right, and you know, ransomed them back. But if a lowly soldier or an archer had done that, an English, average English archer and bowman is not going to do that. He's not going to be able to ransom them. I could have to hand them over to the king. So they just killed them. So you're looking at the first act stirrings in this war of what would be considered a modern concept of war. Even the Romans, for all of their, you know, advanced war machine, Roman soldiers had to buy their own armor. It wasn't issued to them. This would come later in the 15th and 16th centuries when we have this idea that the state provides everything the soldiers need. I mean, soldiers will still add to their own equipment, but there is state-issued standard-issue equipment and standardization. Again, before this time period, vessels like in ships like this one, like the Grace Geo, were not standard construction. Blueprints were not laid out for a whole class of ships. You would lay out blueprints for a single ship. You'd have basically the master shipwright who would be in charge of the ship building. Sometimes they wouldn't even use blueprints, they just use their own memory and guide construction. So with the loss of this vessel and into the re future reigns of kings like Henry VII, not really Henry VI, he was an idiot, but Henry VII, Henry VII starts to get rid of the idea of all the barons having their own armies. Henry VIII gets rid of the idea of having a ragtag navy and having a professional one. Ships like this were the first stirrings of that concept of purpose-built commissioned ships that were there for the defense of the realm in one form or another. Now, although the vessel only went to sea once, it was still used as a defensive measure to blockade and control the entry to the River Humber. And it did that job fine. It was just a bit of a waste. But that's why this ship interests me. And it's why the Battle of Agincourt interests me, not just because it was an English victory. That's not overly important. I mean, I am British, but it's not the only thing I, I think about. I'm, anyway, those things interest me because I know what they are the beginnings of. You see, it's the beginnings of change, the beginnings of modernization, the beginnings of the idea of a profe of larger professional army. Ever since the Romans have been in Britain, there's always been a small professional core of soldiers. You could argue that in the Celtic period, warriors, there was a warrior elite. So there was always a small professional core. But those professionals would still have to buy their own weapons, their own armor. There was no standardization. You often were like peacocks on the battlefield trying to stand out. It was kind of stupid. This is the beginning to the end of that. And that's why it interests me as a time period, generally and why I'm bringing this video to you. Now, I'm not going to go into the full history of weapons because I know I'm starting to go off onto a tangent again and I have that habit. So I'm going to end this video here. Please like, share, subscribe and comment down below. If you made it all to the end of the video, thank you for watching. Please check out my sponsor, so to speak, The Beard Struggle. 
Linked in the description below, get your 15% discount on your first purchase if you follow that link. You won't get it if you just go to their website, by the way. You've got to actually follow that link specifically. But I'm going before I get into another tangent. Bye-bye.